Uh, we're going to get started. Hi, and welcome to the Policy Work Speaker Series today. I'm Stephanie Anderson, a second year at the PhD student in school education. This talk is part of the EPW Speaker Series, sponsored by the Baker Fund for Political Economy. Each semester, EPW hosts a number of talks from external and sometimes internal, like students today, on a host of education policy and research related topics. These talks are free and open to the public. For more information on that policy works or the speaker series, please visit our website. Uh, today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Tracy Sweet. Tracy Sweet is an associate professor in the Measurement Statistics and Evaluation Program, the Department of Human Development uh, and Quantitative Methodology at the University of Maryland. She completed her PhD in statistics at Carnegie Mellon University and an MA in mathematics at Morgan State University. Her research focuses on methods for social network analysis, with particular focus on multi-level social network models, machine learning, and racial, racial equity in data science and statistics. Uh, she serves as the Associate Director of Research for the UMCP for the Maryland Longitudinal Data System uh, Center, and is currently overseeing projects applying data science and statistical methods to large-scale education data. Dr. Sweet will be talking for approximately one hour and we have 15 minutes for discussion and questions. Uh, please note that any additional or personalized questions after 1.15 can be addressed via email as other meetings will begin at this time. Uh, thank you for attending that policy work speaker series today and give a warm welcome to Dr. Sweet. Thank you. I'm gonna see if the mic works. Oh, I think it works. Okay. Sorry, I have to realize that I don't have a anything to tell the time and now i don't know where my phone is to Can tell you, the time do you want me to maybe okay. i i think i i don't should i be a little bit oh. all right i'm gonna i have my phone okay i have my phone okay yeah sorry sorry everyone um i don't normally give a talk for a whole hour um so I want to teach that I want to treat this as if you are in my class. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be giving kind of a, a school like lecture today as opposed to just like a conference talk. Um, so you can feel kind of how what it would be like to, you know, be in class with me today. So that's what we're going to we're going to do. Um, but I'm also going to tell you a little bit about me. So I have a lot of social networky things to talk about today. I don't know if this is working. OK. Um, so I'm going to give you a really brief, um, maybe I'll put it here, uh, really brief introduction to social networks. We're going to talk about some of the research questions that you can answer. Um, I'm going to present kind of two main models, latent space models, um, and mixed membership stochastic block models. And then we're going to talk about kind of, can we do interventions on networks and what that might look like? And then also thinking about whether or not we can think about networks as mediators, like in a mediation analysis. So let's see. Um, I apologize for the resolution here, but I really wanted to be able to, um, I really wanted to be able to write on my screen. So we're gonna make, make this work. Um, a little bit about me. I am a transracial adoptee. So I was adopted from Korea. I grew up low income. I started my PhD at 28. Um, I had two kids in graduate school, and I had my third kid as a faculty member. So just some background and then kids. Um, okay, so what is the social network? We kind of, you know, you may have heard the term social network. Maybe you're on Twitter. Maybe you've heard of something called Facebook. Um, we define the social network as a set of relationships or ties uh, among a group of individuals or entities. For example, you could have online relationships, you could have in real life relationships, friendships, workplace relationships. Um, but we also could think about relationships between things that are not necessarily people. We could be thinking about political alliances between countries, for example. And the types of research that we typically see on social networks and education involve students and teachers. So we might be interested in something like student friendships um, or teacher advice seeking, right? How do teachers kind of learn from each other? Um, we also see things in terms of like access to resources. So just some, some examples there from, from some educational studies. Okay, so if I collect data, what does that look like? 
um, we can think of data kind of in a like a square n by n matrix. And so what that looks like typically, if I had five people in my network, I'd have everybody across the, the columns and everyone across the rows. And so then if I'm looking at, you know, a one, that would mean that person two is sending a tie to person four. That's basically what that means in the network. I can also represent these data with a picture, right? And so typically what we'll see is we'll see the people in the network represented by these vertices. And then you'll see the direction of a tie going from one person to the next person. So we said that there's a tie from person two to person four. And if you look at the picture, right, we do see that there is this tie going from person two to person four. So really simple network, really simple matrix, but you, you can get the idea. Um, now, what you're seeing in terms of both the, the matrix and the network plotted is you're looking at a binary binary network. So binary network, what do I mean? Well, either you're friends with someone or you're not friends with someone. Either you co-authored that paper with someone or you didn't co-author a paper, right? Well, we also could have ties that are ordinal or continuous. Um, and what that might look like would be something like, how often do we hang out, right? Do we hang out every day? Do we hang out once a week? Do we hang out once a month? Um, and those ties might look something a little bit different, right? Maybe the ties would be a little bit thicker for the people that hang out a lot. And the ties could be, you know, really thin for the people that you don't hang out with that much, right? So you could visualize that. And then in terms of what numbers would go in the matrix, you know, it could be whatever you wanted, whether you wanted it to be normally distributed with like a standard zero, zero one distribution, or if you wanted to go from like zero to five, uh, whatever. Now, the other thing that I wanna mention is the directionality, right? Cause I keep talking about person two sending a tie or yeah, person two sending a tie to person four. Um, we could have that type of relationship, right? I might, I person two might go to Jamie person four for advice, right? But there are relationships that are not necessarily directed um, something like co-authorship would be undirected, right? We either both co-author the paper or we both don't. So basically a tie in one direction implies a tie in the other direction, in which case the matrix up here would be symmetric, okay? And the network wouldn't have arrows, right? You just have the, you'd have the, the lines. Okay, so um, I'm gonna drop this slide. I dropped this slide in kind of as a teaser because I'm not gonna talk about any of this really, again. But if you're curious, right, because most people that are collecting social network data are, are curious about how do I describe it, right? What are the things that I can put in papers when I want to describe a network? Um, we can describe kind of the network as a whole, right? So I can talk about something like density, which is the, the proportion of observed ties out of the proportion of total possible ties, right? So if I have a density of, you know, 0.8, that means every single, almost every single tie that's available, is observed. If I have a density of like 0.05, that means I have a very few number of ties out of all the ties that I could see. Um, here, you know, this this would be an example of a, something that's typically typical in terms of, of network density, which is around 0.2 for a network of this size. Um, reciprocity. So if I have ties that can go in a certain direction, then I might be also interested in the rate at which those ties also are reciprocal, right? So I might nominate Vivian as a friend, like every single survey I'm given, and she might never nominate me as a friend, right? So our friendship has a low reciprocity. Um, and you might see, like, if you're interested in peer relationships, you might really be interested in reci reciprocal relationships, right? Every time, you know, so-and-so nominates someone else, is that nomination then reciprocated, okay? The other thing that people care a lot about is um, something called transitivity, which depending on what network, paper, textbook you're reading, there's like five different definitions of transitivity, but we'll just start stick with one. Um, you can think of transitivity as every time I see a tie going from one node to another node, and then going from that node to a third node, do I then see the tie from the first node to the third node. So basically that's what transitivity means is 
if I know that I'm going getting advice from someone and then that person is getting advice to someone else, do I then just eliminate the middle person and I go straight to them? Right. So in an advice seeking relationship, that's kind of the idea behind transitivity. In pure networks, um, transitivity is really common because friends of my friend tend to be my friend. Right. So if I'm always hanging out with someone and they're always hanging out with someone else, chances are the three of us are, are hanging out and will probably be friends or probably are friends. So network researchers care a lot about transitivity. That's just the network. The way that we describe nodes, um, typically what people care about most are the nodes that are really central. Right. So that's the nodes that have lots of ties coming in or have lots of ties going out. Um, Sometimes people care about the nodes that are not connected at all, right? People that are isolated, that could be important. Um, so those are kind of, and there's many, many measures of, of central nodes. I'm not gonna go into them here, but they're textbooks and you can see there's like four or five kind of standard measures and then there's like four or five additional measures that, that people have come up with uh, since. Okay, so now we kind of have, have done our introduction Let's start talking about some research questions. Um, so when you're trying to do some type of statistical inference, there's kind of two main categories that, that we can do, right? So we can think about um, social selection or we can think about social influence. What are the differences, right? Either we have the network as the outcome or the network as a predictor. Those are, that's the big, big difference between those two sets of, of models. So if I care about the network as an outcome, Basically, my goal is to figure out why do people have ties in a network? Why does a particular network exist? How did that network come to be? What is causing or associated with those relationships? And so I might be interested in identifying or quantifying the effect to which certain covariates, right, predict network ties. So if I'm interested in graduate students, who is working with whom, right? How important is race? How important is gender? How important is um, the the year that you started as a as your as a first year student? Right. I have all of this information. How important is? I guess I learned today that you have a number of programs in a single department. Right. So how important is the the name? You know what program you're in. All of those things contribute to whether or not you're going to be collaborating or working with other people. Okay. And so one of the questions that I've answered in my research is something like, are teachers with more experience the ones providing advice, right? Does that matter? Um, and we found that it doesn't matter, which is interesting. Um, or at least we were not able to detect that it matters. I should say that. Um, on the other hand, if I'm interested more as the network, um, as a predictor, right? So I have this network, it exists. How can I somehow map this network into change that I'm seeing in people? Right, and that's this idea of social influence. You all are familiar with social influence. There are things called influencers, right? <laughs> Maybe some of you are influencers right now, and we just don't know. Um, right, we are all um, subject to social influence, right? In terms of what research we choose, what journals we submit papers to, what conferences we attend. You maybe are like, wait, that's social influence, right? Um, what right, where we go to restaurants, what recreational activities we, we participate in, all of those things, social influence. And so if I know, right, that I have these relationships with certain people, I might wanna quantify the extent to which I am influenced in certain areas, right? So I might see something like um, what restaurant I choose to go to on a Saturday night, right, might be more likely to be influenced by the people that I'm friends with than my political beliefs, for example, right? And so I can quantify that, I can set up a model, I can predict um, uh, the amount of social influence. And so one of the things that I've done in my own research is fit models that look at the extent to which um, if I am exchanging advice with someone or teachers are exchanging advice with people in schools, um, how does that affect their beliefs about teaching mathematics? And so we found that teachers that exchange advice with others, right? You're the people that you go to for advice about math, their mathematic beliefs influence your mathematic beliefs. Um, so that's something that we did find. Okay, and then just more questions. So maybe you're not interested in advice seeking among teachers, but just 
more examples of social selection and social influence class, uh, question, um, research questions. This is a good stopping point. Do we have questions? Are there questions? Okay, I mean, you don't have to have questions. It's fine. It's it's fine to not have questions. But if there are, just so we can, like, I forgot to set some, some norms, some cultural norms for the talk. If there are questions, feel free to stop me during, you don't have to hold, wait at the end, just, you know, we're, this is a class, we're in class, right? People are eating, we're, right? This is relaxed. We're, we're okay. Yes. So yeah. In order to, um, to be able to analyze networks, you have to typically collect data when you're asking for networks, or are you able to, to infer from <laughs> or in, like, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so tip, I would say most of the time people are collecting network data by asking individuals to to nominate or say, um, you know, who are their friends, that sort of thing. I think friendship is particularly hard to measure without asking people directly. Um, but there are some studies where teachers have actually um, constructed the networks based on their own observations of what kids are playing together, so that's another way. Um, you can actually like um, pool networks, like, you know, in terms of like data mining, you could pool um, email networks, right? Like I could pull, all, well, I don't know if I could, but someone could pull all of UVA's email um, and that would be, you know, a, a huge network or Twitter or something like that. Um, there is a whole other field that I'm not gonna talk about at all. Um, this whole field called network psychometrics. And that, that goal, the goal of that field is to take basically like co-occurrence of different things, of different items, and trying to infer a network from that. So that's that's over there. So we're not going to talk about that. Here, we're going to talk about like, we assume that we have a network. Question. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think a lot of it comes from context and then both some, un like, unfortunately, some decisions that the analyst has to make, right? So something like advice seeking, we wouldn't expect it to be a symmetric relationship because there are certain people that you go to advice and certain people that are kind of providing the advice. Um, something like friendship, right, is something I think could be both. Right, it could be something that is symmetric because you would argue, well, if we're friends and that is a relationship that we both should be aware of. Um, but we also know that friendship not is not necessarily symmetric, right? Because we all have our own kind of perspectives about friendship. Um, so I think it really depends on both the research, the context, um, and you do have to make some kind of gray area decisions. Because um, I've seen papers where people will define friendship as both parties have to nominate each other and then their friends. I've seen um, papers where one person nominates the other and then the assumption is, well, if they nominated the other person, then they're friends. Um, and then I've seen uh, papers where um, they they just, oh, I guess those are the two options. That one, that one. Yeah, yeah, just the, those are the two options. Um, yeah, so I think it's I think it's hard, yeah. Any questions? That's good. I like the questions. Keep them coming. Um, all right. So we, for the purposes of this talk, just because I can't talk about everything, um, are going to talk about social selection models, right? So this idea of figuring out why do people have ties? Why do two people have ties? Um, and there's kind of two big classes of, of models out there. They're, you know, depending on your network analysis, um, amount of prior information, you might be really familiar with exponential random graph models. Historically, they kind of came first. Um, if you have, you know, a big network analysis textbook, those are the models that are gonna be in the textbook. Um, they've just been around longer. They tend to be cited more. Um, the problem with these models is that we're actually, and for those of you that don't think about models in this way, it's okay, you don't have to, um, but we're modeling the observance of the entire network right, out of the space of all networks. So when we're talking about like the probability of observing a network, we're talking about the probability of observing the entire matrix divided by all possible matrices of that size, right? That's kind of a hard 
problem to think about because the bigger the network, the more possible networks, it becomes kind of an intractable problem. Um, and there's this thing about tie dependence, right? So if I'm friends with Vivian, Vivian's friends with Jamie, right? That those relationships are not independent of each other, right? Because that's going to impact the likelihood that Jamie and I are friends. Um, and so what all of these network models do is handle this weird dependence that exists among relationships, right? Relationships are, we can't just say they're not, um, they're not the same as people's heights, right? My relationship with someone impacts my relationship with someone else. If I'm giving advice, to 10 people in this room, it's really gonna be hard for me to give advice to another 10 people in this room, right? So there's just a lot of things that kind of impact the probability of, of two people having a certain type of relationship. So exponential random graph models try to handle this dependence in a way that's explicit. Question? Yeah, so I'm trying to understand the, the utility of being able to come up with the probability of like that sort of work. Is that for the purposes of like, Doing statistical inference, or like why? Why would I want to know this probability? It's not that you want to know the probability as a number, but you're trying to model the probability so that you can estimate the covariates. Because what we really want to know is we want to know, right? Does being the same gender matter? Does um, the the number of years that you've been here as a student does that matter? Like we're trying to figure out what are the things that matter for this particular network. I guess conceptually, I'm just trying, I'm having a, a bit of difficulty understanding why you know, the, the, this particular uh, network as over all possible network, network, what conceptually is that getting me towards? Like, it might have to do with like math, even in a really deep way, not that on the like a research question that I don't care about. So the research question is not the model, right? So we don't we don't typically right when you think about a regression equation, um, the regression equation doesn't map onto a normal distribution, right? The the sorry the research question for your regression equation doesn't map to normal distribution, but the regression equation is based on a normal distribution, and so we use the fact that regression is based on a normal distribution. That's where our probability comes from. So we don't think about regression in terms of probability, but actually the model itself is based on this idea of a distribution, right? We don't think about it that way because we think it's regression. We're used to interpreting the betas, all of that stuff. But, but the way that we build that model is we take, right, that y equals beta zero plus beta one x, right, plus epsilon, and we 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 layer it. Like the assumption is, is that those residuals follow a normal distribution, right? What I'm saying is that for this model, we have a couple of different ways we can take the equation, we can layer it. We can't layer it on a normal distribution, right? Because normal distributions, you have the assumption that the observations are independent. So we have to layer it on some other type of distribution. And I'm saying that this particular class of models, the distribution that we're layering on is complicated and weird. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right. So because it's, weird and hard to deal with. Um, we typically, if we use these models, what happens is that when you estimate them, you either get networks that are all zeros or all ones, um, which are not realistic, right? Or it just doesn't work at all. So these models have been kind of put aside um, in favor of these other types of models called latent variable models. And latent variable models are everywhere. I IRT, SEM, all of those things, mixture models, all latent variable models. So latent variable models are great in that um, it allows us to do things that are a, a little bit more intuitive. So one thing that's really nice about latent variable models is that we're now able to say things like, okay, if we know the latent variables, which we don't, but if we knew, knew them, then we can think of all the ties and our network is independent. That sounds reasonable, right? It's a kind of the same thing with item response theory. If we know everyone's thetas, right, then the responses to the items we can think of as independent. Um, same idea. We know everyone's latent variables. We can think of everyone's ties as independent. Um, and so this conditional independence allows us to do a lot of really nice things in terms of estimating models, thinking about models, interpreting models, all of that stuff. Okay. Sorry, this mic is... Can you all hear me? Okay, I'm loud enough. All right. 
Um, so like I said, people tend to f prefer latent variable network models, especially people like that are learning about them for the first time because they are more intuitive. You can fit them more easily. Um, and because exponential random graph models do have kind of this degeneracy problem. Okay, so in the world of latent variable models, right, just like we have SEM and IRT, um, we can think of uh, latent variable network models as latent space models and block models. I'm gonna talk about both today if I have time. I probably won't have time though, because I'm already at 1226. <laughs> um, so we'll see. So let's talk about latent space models. All right, so here's the idea behind a latent space model. Um, we have a network. The latent, latent variables in the model is that every node in the network has a spot, a position, and a low dimensional latent space. That's the assumption we make for the model. And so what that means is that the nodes that are close together in the latent space are more likely to have a tie between them than the nodes that are really far apart. Right, so we're just using Euclidean distance Right, you can see the distance between those positions. The ones that are closer are more likely to have a tie than the ones that are further apart. And if you look at the network that is kind of generated from these positions, right, the nodes that are, oops, that, that doesn't match. The nodes that are close together in the latent space are more likely to have ties than the nodes that are far apart, right? You see node six out here, doesn't have any ties. The latent space, it's far away. Okay. The other really nice thing about latent space models is that when I write them out, hey, especially if I have a binary network, this looks like logistic regression, right? It feels good. We like logistic regression. We might not like odds ratios, but we like logistic regression. We like this idea of interpreting data. Um, and because we have these latent variables on the end, we can't even do odds ratios. So you don't have to think about them either. So you get all of the, the good things about logistic regression and none of the bad things. Um, so then why do we fit these models? The goal again is, is beta. We want to know, right, are these betas significant, right? Are they somehow statistically different from zero? Is there somehow an effect of certain covariates on the probability of having a tie? So here's an example. Here is, my program, um, although it was called Measurement and Statistics Evaluation, it is now called Quantitative Methodology colon Measurement and Statistics. Um, but you're looking at a co-authorship network from the years 2020 and 2021, okay? The red nodes are faculty, the blue nodes are alumni, and the yellow nodes are students. And so you can see, right, people are authoring papers. So good, good job, good job. UMD, we're authoring papers. Okay, but we might be interested in how does someone's position, whether they're a student, alum, or faculty, uh, impact the likelihood of co-authoring a paper, right? So maybe I come up with a covariate that talks about being in the same position. So this would be considered an edge covariate, right? Does node one, do node one and node two, are they both students? Are they both faculty? Are they both alums? Okay. That could be one covariate. Another covariate I could include in this model is whether someone's a leader. I didn't show you the picture with leaders, but the idea is that, you know, is someone the director of graduate studies? Is someone the program director? Those are the only two leaders we have in my program, so it's just two people that are leaders in every, all the rest of us are non-leaders. Um, I'm not any, I'm a non-leader in the program. But you can see here, right? It's very logistic, logistic regression-y, right? We can see in the model, right? If this is significant, then we're gonna have an effect of being in the same position. If this is significant, we're gonna have an effect of someone being a leader, right? So does the program director or the DGS, do they tend to author more papers? Do we see papers that happen between people that are in the same position? So what you're looking at here is you're looking at 95% credible intervals because these are estimated um, with MCMC. We can kind of think of those as, as confidence intervals-ish, right? But what you're seeing is, is you're seeing that this doesn't cross zero. So there's a negative impact of being in the same position, which means students are not writing papers with students, faculty are not writing papers with faculty, and alums are not writing papers with alums. And that you all are in graduate school or 
part of academia, that makes sense, right? You, you know who's authoring papers with whom because faculty tend to work with their advisees on research. Um, graduate students tend not to co-author papers without a faculty member, although I guess it could happen, but tends not to happen, right? And we also see a significant positive effect of being a leader, right? Which means those two lucky people in my program that are the, the director of graduate studies and the program director, they are more likely to co-author a paper, right? I mean, they're also really good at research, so that's probably why. But if I didn't know that, I might say, oh, it's because there are people in power, and so they're, you know, getting lots of papers. Okay. So now we can kind of see a little bit, we've seen a little bit about what we can do with latent space models, right? So we can think of them as kind of regression-y, right? We did, logis we did a lo logistic regression, quote unquote, latent space model um, for a binary network. You can do them for ordinal networks, continuous networks. It doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you can pick whatever type of paper, right? You decide, the, the person who's collecting the data decides what the relationship is. So I could have a network that includes book chapters, white papers, working papers, um, class paper, right? It, it, I just picked published papers. Oh, right. So it would, that's a great question. I'm trying to think, because we do have co single authored papers. Um, and so the way that that, well, no, we wouldn't have that in the, in the, in the, in the model. No, we would not have that. Yeah, because we, we typically think of the diagonal, like you would, right, that would be, be a number in the diagonal, but the diagonal is actually not part of the, of the model, because we're only interested in cross authorship. Yeah. So, Effect, is that These are the latent positions. Okay, so it's like accounting for how close together you are. This effect these other things. Yeah, and so actually, it's it's and it's you can think of them almost like residual, like a residual error term, because once we know the the kind of the covariate effects, it's like any additional network structure is then accounted for by these these. Yeah. I have some more questions about like. Yeah, that's a good question. You could choose it using like a model selection procedure, but honestly, I feel like most of the time a two dimension or three dimensional latent space works fine equally well. So, yeah, so it's it's a little bit different than when we think of other latent variable models because we care a lot about the latent variables. Um, here, we don't really care about the latent variables. Um, well, I, I, I should say for this particular model, we don't care about the latent variables. We're really using them to kind of soak up residual network structure. Um, there could be situations where you care deeply about the latent variables, um, but they don't necessarily have represent, they don't necessarily represent anything. It's not like a PCA where you can say the first dimension is this and the second dimension is this, mainly because the way that um, the latent variables interact for in terms of the network tie is through the distance, right? So the actual values of the latent variables themselves are meaningless. Um, so in actual, actually, there's like an infinite number, right? Because of rotation, translation, all that stuff. So really all I care about is that distance um, between them and we estimate them as, right, I have n times n minus one distances. So that's too many things to estimate. So it's much easier to estimate n positions and then take the distance between them. Um, and by doing that, it allows me to explain a lot of the variation that I see in the network without having a ton of variables, but we don't necessarily care about each value of them. Yeah, Stephen. I would, for those particular constructs, I would have three, I would have separate networks. Yeah, I'll talk about it if I have time, but there's, there are models um, that one of my um, students 
is working on, who you know, Misha, um, that working on if you have items that are similar enough that could be considered a single construct. Yeah. Yes. What kind of references with your example of leaders also being good researchers? Could we just be thinking this is descriptive or are you going to sort of help us get to the causal? Yes. Yeah, so for now, this is purely descriptive, right? It's this, it, this is progression. This is association only. Yeah. I mean, you could try to do some type of causal um, effect, but you'd have to, it would be the same. You may be making the same assumptions that you would be with any type of causal thing. Yeah. Um, which I think is a little bit harder with network analysis. Yes. So I'm trying to understand conceptually what that is. So I, I, I'm going to put out a, I, a guess, uh, and you tell me if I'm So the idea would be like, if there's somebody who here is just a very prolific researcher, and they just have, they publish lots of things, um, but it's not, you know, they're not necessarily because they're a leader or same, same positionality. They're going to be represented as someone who's very central in the space. Such that that term for them is going to be lower. It's of not that that term, but their distance to everyone else will be lower. Yeah. 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 And you can see that in the network here, right? Like you have someone that's very uh, prolific in terms of research. And this person, if we were to look at the estimated spaces, would be more, more central. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, I think I'm going to skip a couple things. Um, so I'm going to skip, we're going to see this slide and then I'm going to skip a few slides and we're going to just for time. Um, but let's talk about social networks as experimental outcomes. Okay. If I'm thinking about networks of schools or networks of even, even classrooms, right? I can think of doing some type of clustered randomized trial and assigning, you know, these networks to something and these networks to something. Um, and depending on what I'm interested in, uh, the network could actually be kind of like my first outcome, right? Because I'm interested in, you know, some anti-bullying thing. And so I'm kind of curious in how people are interacting once they've, once the treated condition has done this anti-bullying intervention, for example. Um, so I'm going to skip, we're going to skip all this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, you can see my daughter's grumpy face. So that this example was basically um, an intervention effect on a latent space model, and it's not significant grumpy face. Okay, so we're going to skip, and I'm going to do the exact same thing, but it will work, but with a different model. So let's talk about these models. We haven't talked about block models yet. So latent space models, latent variable is these positions. Block models, the latent variable is what community or subgroup you belong to. Okay, so here, really, really simple model, right? For a binary network, probability or the log odds probability that there's a tie is purely dependent on what subgroups we both belong to. So if we belong to the same subgroup, there's some probability that there'll be a tie. If we belong to different subgroups, there's some other probability that there's a tie. Okay, typically these types of um, models are used for models where we do have some type of like block structure, right? And you know, what what network this one belongs to, we're not sure, but this idea that we can kind of group people, right? So if I can kind of group people, then I can say the people that are in the same group are more likely to have ties than people that are in different groups. And I can, I can estimate that. Um, that works well when networks are like, you know, nice and, and, um, you know, well separated, but sometimes we need models that allow people to belong to multiple groups, not necessarily because we believe people belong to multiple groups, but because the networks that result, right? We don't always see networks where we're like, where it's like a, um, a John Hughes movie where we're like, these are the jocks and these, right? We don't, like life doesn't happen that way, right? We have networks that are a little bit more messy where we have more cross uh, subgroup connection. And so what these models allow us to do is to say, okay, rather than everybody belonging to a group, and once you're in a group, that's it, that's your group. Now what we can say is, okay, every time you interact with a certain person, you belong to a certain group, 
they belong to a certain group, and that impacts the probability of you having a tie. But when you interact with somebody else, you could belong to a different group and they could belong to a different group. So that everybody kind of belongs to a specific group only when they're interacting with certain people and that that group can change. Or it could be the same. It really just depends on what your interactions look like. Um, we can just ignore the model part and what I just said is what's written there. Um, for those of you that are like, no, no, we really need to talk about the model. Um, that's fine too, right? We still have this block to block or subgroup to subgroup membership probability, right? There's this matrix. And if you're in the same group, there's some probability of a tie. And if you're in different groups, you have a different probability of a tie. What is different is that, right? Every time I send a tie, right? So every time person I sends a tie to person J, right? I have some probability vector of belonging to a certain group. And every time person J receives that tie from person I, right? Um, then I, there's some other probability vector that I sample from, and that tells me what probability or, or what group they belong to. It's, it's not so important, um, the model, but I'm happy to refer you to, to a paper where you can read more about it if you'd like. Yes? Yeah, just a reminder. It's not it's not based on a Lane class model because it came out of a different I mean it's all about silos, right? So it came out of a different silo because it came out of um well it came out of some mixed membership, which is basically Layton class analysis, but it, again, different silos. But yeah. Uh, probability yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this, I mean, it's basically rated this is for networks. And so if you had a network, um, you could, there's probably like another way I could take a lot latent class analysis and apply it to networks. It just so happens that this model kind of does the same thing. So this this model has been proposed specifically for networks. I don't know that there's one that is similar for lit, like. So like you know, oh, I don't. Yes, I don't know. I'm not as familiar with latent class analysis, so I can't. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think they're. I think they're mostly the same. Right, but they come out of different things. And because the models are specified a little bit differently, I'm gonna use them a little bit differently. Yeah, so again, you can ignore the equation. The thing that we care most about is this thing, the thing you're like, this. why does this matter, right? So this theta is the parameter that tells you what group you belong to when you're interacting with different people. And so in particular, it's a Dirichlet distribution. And if you don't know what that is, that's, a, that's okay. Um, when the Dirichlet distribution is small, what happens is that it means there's a lot of probability of people belonging to a single group, almost always, all the time, right? As this Dirichlet parameter increases, right, what happens is, is that now the probability of belonging to um, different groups increases, right? And so instead of always belonging to group one, right, as this parameter is increasing, now I might be like, oh, 5% of the time I'll belong to group two and 10% of the time I belong to group three. As it increases, all of a sudden it's, oh, I have equal probability of belonging to all the groups, right? Mathematically, you might be like, okay, that's fine. But what does that look like in terms of networks? This is what it looks like. When gamma's really small, right? We see networks that are really insular, right? I can see these groups. I can see them. I can see my John Hughes movie, right? I have my clicks. As gamma increases, you could still argue, well, I kind of like I kind of see, right? There's like these people kind of have more ties and these people seem to have more ties, but it's not as obvious. And but by the time gamma um, is what I'm quote unquote I'm gonna say larger, is we don't see any of this block structure anymore, right? It just looks like a big blob of a network. 
And so this idea is we can actually treat gamma as a measure of subgroup and celerity, right? It's, I can fit this model, I can estimate gamma, and I can basically rank every network if I fit the model all at the same time, I can basically rank every network in terms of most insular to least insular, okay? Um, and so I can take this model, again, you could ignore the, the equation stuff, but I can take this model and I can say, hey, right, this gamma, I can put a treatment effect on it. So I can say treated networks, you're in the treated condition, you're gonna have some measure of insularity, and if you're in the control condition, then you're gonna have a different measure of insularity. Um, and so that's the model that I'm gonna to present to you right now. What? Oh, we still have a little bit of time. Okay, 12.45. Um, it is like it is just like being in class, um, where I'm like, oh, we'll have to do these slides next week. Um, we have eight schools that were assigned a district coach. So this this district, you know, it was, right during the no child left behind stuff. And they were like, new math curriculum, high stakes testing in math, high stakes testing in ELA, go, right? Um, and all these things happened within 18 months. And the district was like, what are we, what are we gonna do? And so they decided we're gonna hire instructional coaches. We're gonna make it, these coaches work. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. And so we have data on schools that have the networks of schools in their first year of having an instructional coach. And so this is not really a true causal thing because I just matched them based on um, network size to schools that didn't have a coach, right? So it's not, people were not randomly assigned. It's, so I'm cheating a little bit. But the, the condition, right, the treatment is basically what is the effect of having this coach on the network structure? Um, so what you are looking at is you're looking at the treated schools, you're looking at the control schools. Um, you can kind of see the treated schools maybe look a little bit different than the control schools. Maybe they're a little bit less insular. Um, but we fit, I fit the model, right? My goal is to kind of estimate this treatment effect, right? What is the effect of um, <clears throat> having a coach on your gamma, right? Remember, gamma controls this insularity, and here's my 95% credible interval, right? It is, there is a positive effect, which means the gammas in schools that have coaches are higher, they're less insular than the schools that don't have coaches. Okay, so yay. That's, that's that. So if I can do an intervention on networks, right, then I can also do a mediation analysis on networks, I would think, right? And so that's kind of the next piece of this, of this story, is if I have um, an independent variable, right, I can kind of think of my mediator as a network, and then I have some dependent variable. So if I plug in a network for a mediation model, so when I was doing this, this was, maybe like five or six years ago, I was working on this work. Um, and this is literally what I did. I was like, let me write out my three equations. I'm gonna plug out the network. And then I basically was like, okay, that's what it would look like. And then instead of network, what I really want, is I really want gamma there because I'm really interested in the effect of this intervention on the subgroup insularity parameter. Um, okay, so I'm gonna plug gamma in, but then it has to be this complicated model. Right, because this is the model from before. That's what gets me my gamma. This is the Bayesian version of the mediation model of equations two and three. Um, and again, you don't have to worry if these equations are not useful or helpful, then just don't look at them, right? You can just look at this picture, okay? So we're trying to figure out, can we estimate an indirect effect uh, between an, the independent variable and the dependent variable? Um, just a caveat that I did have to, there is a identifiability issue, so I did have to um, fix this matrix. Um, but here, again, here's our, our kind of our research question, right? Is there a mediation effect? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, the beliefs about math. So let's talk about the beliefs about math. We have two sets, two constructs of beliefs. 
Um, Jim Spillan and his researchers called them procedural beliefs and student-centered beliefs. So I'm just using, I'm using their terms. Um, but you can kind of see maybe for those of you that have, have classroom experience, right? That the procedural beliefs were, are kind of all about, you know, this should be taught first. You have to, you know, kids have to know their arithmetic and know their, and then they can learn more complicated things. And it's all about kind of order and you can kind of see um, why those items would stick together. The student-centered beliefs are all about kind of where the, the teacher, like what is the role of the teacher in the classroom? Is the teacher there like me being here and being like knowledge, 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 right? Or should the teacher be kind of the person like guiding the inquiry, that sort of stuff? So those are the two sets of beliefs that we're gonna talk about today. So in our big model, we have the treatment effect, right? Is there a math coach in the in the school? Um, our outcome is the change in beliefs about mathematics during the course of the year. Um, and what you're seeing is you're seeing kind of, yes, we see this effect of being, so this, this one, this is here, right? So this one is basically, is there an effect of the intervention on gamma, which we already saw, we saw there was, right? We saw that the treated classrooms had had higher gammas than the, the control classrooms. Um, then what we're seeing, we'll ignore this part. If I look at the mediated effect, which is down here, right? Um, in terms of the credible interval, the student-centered construct we see is technically significant. It doesn't cross zero. The procedural, we would say, it, you know, it's weak evidence. It's not significant. Um, depending on whether you're Bayesian or frequentist. Um, either way, if we focus on the student center beliefs, what we would then say is that having a math coach in the classroom, right, impacted the structure of the networks. And the structure of these networks then impacted change in student center beliefs, but not procedural beliefs. So the network itself mediated the effects of having a math coach in the, in the school on teachers' beliefs about mathematics. Now, is this really causal? No, because we need many, many, many more assumptions to make it truly causal. But the idea is that the association, the associational evidence kind of shows you how you could use this if you had either, um, you know, all of the assumptions met or you had a true experiment, right, where you could actually do this mediation analysis. Vivian. Um, can you interpret what the network means? Like like, does it mean that there are more connections or that there are different types of How does how do we interpret that? Yeah, so when we talk about and we talk about insularity, um what that what that means is that there may be less flow, right? Because people tend to be in these more in these clicks. And so in terms of like trying to have kind of district-wide or school-wide change in terms of beliefs about mathematics, you wouldn't have the same type of information flow because everyone is kind of um, siphoned off or siloed off. I mean, it's hard to tell, right? Because we're not, you know, we're just kind of, you know, we're just looking for where, oh, I didn't even see that that was down, sorry. You can't see that as, I don't know why you can't see that as well. Um, but whereas, you know, we do have people that are isolated, but you really do see how the coach is very much at the, the center. And this is the coach, the person that's in the center of some of these treated networks. And you can see how there is kind of this strong information flow. Um, and for the the people that were in the schools, that's they collected um, interview data from the coaches and the teachers. And so that's something that they also found to be the case. So this was from a mixed method study. Um, and so a lot of, you know, conversations about math um, were happening and that the coach was able to really provide a lot of knowledge that that wasn't really happening in, in some of the control schools. Yeah. Yes. You mean like, do you mean like prior distribution specifications? Yeah, yeah, so there, we don't have, so it doesn't have, we don't have the statistics in the same way that SEM has like 
a long history of that statistic research. Um, but you can tell if your not if your network model is fitting your data well in terms of if it's predicting networks that are similar to your network. Basically, that's kind of you know, and we do that using like predictive um, posterior checks, that sort of stuff. Um, but no, there isn't. Um, we're not quite far along because it's really just me doing this. Um, so if anyone else wants, you know, jump on in. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, I mean, it, hopefully we can get further in terms of goodness fit, so, yeah. Uh, I just want to understand the, uh, the metrics okay. that uh, when you were first describing it, uh, it, it reminded me of a, a entity in the analysis. Uh, so like, you know, like the first of it, um, but with um, the entity maybe the higher the number, the more, the stronger the class structure, um, uh, it fits the data and more likely um, uh, the subjects are going to belong to one, one class and not others. Um, but also, it seems like um, uh, that the gamma um, could be um, could be distinct for a uh, uh, different block of the uh, remembering right? It's distinct for the network, it's a measure of the network. So it's not for different. It's not. It's it's not for different blocks within the network, but it's a it's a network level measure. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it's maybe related to a entity. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
those network connections. But it's not like their job, like their job. I, I mean, to some extent, yes, but they were also teachers okay. too. So it's, I mean, right? Like, it's not like they were hired to only be the coach. Okay, it's not like a new person. It's someone. Well, sometimes they are new from a different school that they were transferred because they were like, you're really good at teaching math. So we want you to be a math teacher in the school and also be the coach. So nobody was, it's not like there was like some independent organization that was like, here is your coach. It's basically someone in the school and then now they're the they're the coach. Uh, so the kind of factor would be that there was there was one fewer person for no. the same number of people. I mean, yeah. But I do think the designation, right? So there's something to think about like is designating somebody as a formal leader, which is what a lot of this work by Jim Spillan and others has, has found that having people designated as former leaders does increase the likelihood of people going to them. Right. So it could right that is something to do with it too. Yeah. Going from I mean, is it the case that, I mean, you described to us earlier the sort of binary relationship to either you have a tie or you don't, as opposed to some continuous measure of the depth of the tie, however you frame it. I'm taking it that these are just, do you have a relationship, a binary kind of Yeah, so these were advice seeking, just are you, are you going to this person for advice on a monthly or more frequent basis? That was the... But in terms of interpreting it the way you did, Shouldn't we believe that the people who had stronger relationships, in fact, were more likely to change their practice? Yes, we would. Yeah, but we didn't look into that. Yeah. So that is something that we could look into for sure. Yeah. As for related thing, is there a way in this framework you can disaggregate the extent to which the change in the network structure is driven by the direct connections through the coach as opposed to connections made between teachers that are not through the coach? I was wondering if you you could sort of under, think about two treatment pathways there, sort of like the direct effect of like I'm connected to teacher one and teacher three are connected via the coach, but they don't actually talk to one another. Versus, you know, they actually yeah. connected. Is there a way to disaggregate that? I mean, not in this particular model, but yes, if you. I mean, I would say yes if you have that network data that you could do that, right? That you could look at. Um, you know, whether you're looking at insularity or looking at some other measure, you could do that kind of by removing that coach versus not removing that coach. Um, but I would argue it kind of depends on your purpose, right? If your purpose is really just looking at how the system as a whole is operating, right? Does it really matter if someone has that label or not if they're doing the same thing? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I'm kind of agnostic about it, but I think it depends on your purpose. What are you want to do it? Like the way that frame that that latter thing is important the idea that i'm not just this person who's now here and everyone goes to me for advice it sort of seems like there's a person who's actually influencing the structure of the network and so being able to sort of see whether they're actually the ties are not just right but actually direct it seems like it would be, at least from my perspective would be like a yeah yeah for sure here i will give you a sneak peek into the stuff that i skipped if i can do that really quickly um, so here is an example of an, a treatment effect where we're looking at the connectivity overall, not just insularity. So this is just straight proportion of connections. Um, and so that's through like the variance of the latent positions. And you can see kind of like if the variance is large, very few connections. The variance is small, much more connections. And so this is this idea of if we're comparing here, the treatment effect is time, right? We're comparing networks from 2011 to 2015, right? Do we see, do we see this effect? And we didn't, right? We didn't necessarily see like more ties. Um, although it's, you know, kind of on the border, but yeah. Did you have a question? I, I, I was interested in um, your approach for doing this in the connected context in terms of um, when you're working with sort of a qualitative team. Like, do you have, I mean, um, the potential for this is really nice, right? Because it's, it has a way to be able to work both the quantitative and on the qualitative side to be able to check or confirm, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was curious, like, do you have a process in terms of how, like, does one come before the other or like how to Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't, I've only been involved in a couple of mixed methods analyses. Um, and 
I think I would say that it kind of evolves as opposed to like one side does this and then I do this. Um, I do know that in one of the one of the studies, they were really interested in putting teachers in buckets. They were like, we really want to be able, this was the study, it was all special education teachers in um, Pittsburgh. And I mean, these were like special education schools, right? So all the teachers are special education. Um, we want really want to put people in buckets. And I said, well, I, what do you mean you want to put people in buckets? Like, what does that mean? And so basically over the conversations um, was, you know, they were, they were like, well, you know, on the qualitative findings, we're really seeing that there are kind of these kind of types of people that are emerging. So we have people that are like, you know, they're really into collaborating. Um, they're really kind of popular. Um, and can we mirror that with the quantitative? And so I did some descriptive statistics stuff that basically found that, yeah, if we if we kind of um, look at like the top 10% of people in terms of the number of ties coming in and out, I can look at the number of ties, like the number of times people are nominated. Um, we can put, like I can create these buckets they have their qualitative buckets. And then we were able to kind of say like, you know, it didn't, or it's never perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't like, hey, the people in my buckets are exactly the same people that you have in your buckets. Like what? But it was it was a very much like, there are these buckets of people, they were able to talk to their people and then there was some overlap. So that was the, basically the point of the paper. So I think it depends. I don't know with the mediation stuff in terms of um, mixed method, just because, those, I feel like those kind of, the data that you need for that tends to be, um, it's just such a more intense data collection. And so I feel like the people that are working with that much data tend not to be qualitative, which is not to say that you couldn't do it. But I think we would, I think we would have to have a conversation from beginning. To, like, I don't know that it would be something that I could just come into and be like, oh, you collected this qualitative data that I happen to be able to do this complicated quantitative thing with. Yeah, I think it would have to be like a partnership from the beginning. Yeah. So from that data, you happen to have like a graph of the study? Yeah, or the one that's qualitative. Oh, that's a, yeah, we did not have great response rates for that. I'm trying to think. I would say that we probably had like, 15 to 25 teachers in each school across five schools, but maybe one of them was really small. So we may have had like 10 to 15 teachers in that school. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I'm trying to think of what, what the name of that paper was, I don't remember. But if you email me, I can email you the name of it. Yeah, all right, I just have a couple of slides. Um, just in case other people ask, have questions about things. Um, so this is, oh, just one more slide. Um, so this is kind of what we saw today, right? We did this introduction. I talked about latent space models. We talked about block models. We talked about interventions. We talked about mediators. That was today. I also do other stuff, right? So I didn't mention anything about influence. So, um, you know, I've done work on social influence models with latent space um, models. I just submitted um, a revision that hopefully is, done, doesn't have to go out for round two, um, for missing data with networks. So what happens when people don't answer your survey? Um, network interference, is that paper is so close to being done. But, but this is the idea of this, people are talking. And if you're going into a school system and you're trying to power your intervention, um, you're powering it, assuming that people are not talking, right? And so what happens when people are talking, even if you're doing um, uh, randomization where the treatment and control groups aren't interacting, just having people interacting within treatment and having people interact within control increases your standard errors and it drops your power by a lot. So that's paper. Um, hopefully it will come out. And then I do other things. I do stuff with machine learning and I do stuff with uh, quant methods for racial equity. So if, I'm happy to answer any questions in our six minutes that we have left <laughs> before we get kicked out. So thank you so much for uh, for coming to the talk. Yes. So I'm thinking about this in most of the presentation. I don't know if I missed it, but like the latent space model, 
how if someone's like fully unconnected to the model, how do you decide where they go? So the they will so the I mean I don't decide, but like when you're estimating the model, basically they get put far out. They just get put distance wise far from everybody. So I would say actually if you have a lot of people that are not connected to anybody, it actually can pose a problem with fitting those models. Because if you're trying to fit everybody so far from each other, then that what happens is that everybody else gets really clumped together. So um, I would probably recommend if you have a lot of isolated people to remove them before fitting a latent space model. Yeah, I feel like one or two is not a big deal, but if you have like 20, yeah. Yes? I'm guessing there's no theoretical but computationally, how large can you go here before? It depends on the model. I mean, I feel like right, the latent space models grow on order of N. So like the number of nodes as opposed to anything else, which is actually pretty nice. So it's just kind of growing as your sample size is growing as opposed to growing as the number of ties grow. Um, so I feel like you can probably go pretty big. There's actually a lot of other methods um, for estimation that are much faster, but I'm old and I do it the way I just taught in graduate school and haven't learned any new, but there's, there's ways that are like, you can do thousands and thousands of nodes like much faster. I just tend to work with small data sets, so I haven't had to do, do that, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think that's, uh, I don't have a paper exactly on that, but there is a paper. It also has latent networks in it, which is confusing. But um, this idea that you are trying to model measurement error, like people lying, people trying to just say what the, you know, what the survey or surveyor wants to hear and how you kind of control for that. And I think the, the model that we ended up going with is not really an IRT model, but I think the basics kind of resemble an IRT approach, right? Because you have items that are just kind of like bad items. Well, you kind of reverse that and think about people. I don't want to say like there are bad people, but people that are just not good for network estimation. And so what you can do is you can kind of downweight their responses. And so even if they're like, oh, I'm friends with everyone, right? You can kind of, if you notice that with, with, with all of their responses because it's it is a survey so you basically have those ones and zeros for you know their entire row and so you can actually kind of come up with like a measure of how reliable they are so it's it's different from like reliability in the measurement sense but you can you can do that yeah i mean it's not like we can't do that it's not like there's an r package to do that but i think there's there's research that is currently being done to kind of get to that point yeah anything else um, I, I'm still trying to understand the, um, what level the, uh, uh the network are at, um, it was a, it was a network-wide representation. It's a network-level variable, yeah. yeah. Network level. Um, whereas, um, for the, um, uh, the mediation model, the, um, um, sorry, what was the, um, the predictor again or the most um, uh, exogenous That was also network level. It was whether or not you have a coach. Okay, okay, that's, 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 um, okay, okay, yeah, that's exactly that. Though. I, I, I was wondering if um, there's a mixture of um, level level things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You gave us a lot of really great examples of thinking about uh, network analysis in the space of um, more granular interventions and in-school experiences um, and networks in that way. Um, have you applied it um, to like a larger scale, more like a policy level um, context? I guess I'm just thinking about like, thinking about um, like common like it rolling up, like these policymakers like influencing each other and state departments influencing each other and things like that. Like, is that sort of I have not done that. I mean, I, I follow the data. So unless, and you know, someone has to collect that data for me to analyze it, basically. <laughs> yeah, and so that's, I'm, you know, I was on, um, 
I was invited to be on, I don't know, I don't think they should have invited me, but I, it's okay, I learned a lot. So, but they, they invited me, it was basically about um, networks and policy, but more about this idea of like how to influence state policy. And I was like the lone methods person being like, but I'm just gonna learn from all of you people um, because I didn't really know much because I don't interact with, you know, po uh, policy makers in general. But um, a lot of the conversation was about, you know, what are the ways that we can even think of policy makers as nodes in a network? How can we use kind of leverage our knowledge about social network theory, which again, not me, but like people that are really well versed in that to kind of um, you know, take it or leverage that for change. And so that was really interesting. So like, I think people are thinking about that. It, the data don't necessarily exist, but I think people are thinking and like trying to make connections there. Yeah. Okay. I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for asking questions. <laughs>